This was the scene in Belfast just before 10 this morning. Barrels of water from the River Boyne were symbolically poured down Clifton Street at the start of this year's procession. Our programme, marking the 300th anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne, will visit the other demonstrations in Northern Ireland today. But for our first report, we remain in Belfast. Since 1988, those at the head of the procession have taken part in a short service at the Cenotaph to remember the dead of two world wars and those who have died at home over the past 20 years. And now the hard work begins. Ahead lie many miles of road that will take them out of town to the field at Edenderry. Some of these men have been walking from their districts to mustering points for over two hours already. Miller Memorial Flute Band have been leading now for 15 years. Behind them come the VIPs and visitors. And behind the front ranks come the junior colour party with the flags of countries where the Orange Order is active. Canada, America, England, Scotland, New Zealand and Togo in West Africa. Noticeable by its absence, though, is the flag of the Irish Republic. Lodges from across the border are represented by the Ulster flag. There are ten districts in Belfast, and for the past 30 years, these have rotated with a different district leading annually. This year, it's the turn of number one, made up of 38 lodges. Altogether, there are 262 lodges on the march in the city, between bands and orange men, over 20,000 people are marching today. And it'll take around two and a half hours for the parade to pass any given point. Duncairn Temperance has unveiled a new banner this year in memory of Thomas Passmore, a former lodge member and past county grandmaster in Belfast. Incidentally, this lodge was formed in Enniscorthy in County Wexford. Every picture tells a story, and there's no shortage of pictures on the banners today. As you'd expect, many of these scenes are biblical, particularly from the Old Testament. King William features prominently, as does the Home Rule period, the two world wars, and in particular, the Battle of the Somme in 1916. One major difference between the banners in Belfast and those at the country demonstrations is the heavy industrial scenes you'll see on these banners. One lodge which has put in more than its fair share of work for this year's special 12th is the Ulster Volunteers in District Number 2. They settled on a float. This is the model of the Mountjoy, the ship which broke the boom ending the siege of Derry. Alfie Hennessy is the lodge secretary. Well, the builder, he went to the Lindenhall Library and took out old prints and, and old maps and things like that. And uh, it is as authentic as we can get it. Did you ever think it would turn out to be as big as it has become? No, we thought originally it would be something about six foot long. And uh, when we saw the final result, we couldn't believe it. We began to get worried how we would get it into the parade, but we were fortunate enough to get, have access to a 40 foot trailer, and it now will be taking part in the parade. Is its size going to be a problem for you? The masts will be, but the masts are on a swivel so that they can be lowered for overhead cables and streamers. Lengthwise will be a problem. We'll not be able to get it into the field. What's going to happen to this model of the Mountjoy after today? Well, I would hope, because there's so much uh, time and effort has gone into the construction of it, I would hope that some museum would take it. Ideally, the apprentice boys would take it. It pertains more to them, actually. And I'd hope if they get their museum, they would, we would certainly give it to them. Meanwhile, back on parade, this is one of two visiting bands from Canada. Whitby True Blues from Ontario were formed only a couple of years ago. They walked in Scotland last weekend and are accompanying Lodge 778. The vast majority of bands are from Northern Ireland, but their ranks are swelled today by 28 Scottish bands and one band from England. It's interesting to look back at how this never-changing spectacle has been marked in the past. 100 years ago, the Belfast Evening Telegraph of Saturday, July the 12th, 1890, started its report by describing the weather. It had been a dull and threatening morning which turned to rain as early as 8 o'clock. A century on, the rain began an hour later and never really stopped. But it didn't dampen the enthusiasm of the spectators. 
of the police a hundred years ago. The paper wrote that as spectators, the constabulary served a useful object. Their somber uniforms bringing into focus the holiday attire of the thousands who thronged the streets. It must have been as colorful an occasion then as it is now. District 5 is the largest on parade today, representing a large chunk of South Belfast. Fifty lodges make up this district, including two which have their roots across the border. County Monaghan True Blues and the loyal sons of County Donegal. None of those who turned up to watch today's spectacle will be disappointed by what they saw on the route. And what they have to say about the weather is another matter. The Belfast procession is the largest in Northern Ireland today. The second largest is the county demonstration in Armagh. And we go there now to join Jeannie Johnston in Newtown Hamilton. Thanks, Paul. Well, nowhere will the tercentenary be celebrated with more enthusiasm than here in County Armagh, where the Orange Order was actually founded. The Orange Men of the County march today to Newton Hamilton. Not only is it one of the biggest marches outside Belfast, it's also the most southerly demonstration because we're just a few miles from the South Armagh border. 15 to 16,000 Orange Men are gathering here at the moment. And what a special year this is. When you think about it, many of the older Orange men will have been looking forward to this tercentenary for maybe 50 or 60 years. There's also a wealth of overseas visitors, and we'll be talking to some of them shortly. Newton Hamilton was not wearing its usual colours today. It's a town which is now predominantly nationalist, but it's also a community which lives in harmony. And the discreet nature of the security forces' presence today reflected this. and his Colonel-in-Chief led the way for the 163 lodges and 125 bands. The task of bringing them from all corners of County Armagh this morning had to be coordinated like a military operation. 130 buses were hired and these all had to make double journeys. One of the hallmarks of the County Armagh demonstration is the Lambeg drum. With a relatively short walk to the field, around one and a half miles, they aren't such a heavy burden, or are they? When the sun's not too bright, like you can manage it okay, okay. So we're enjoying ourselves here today, and we're just here. Is it a, a long way to the field for someone no, like you? No, oh, we're one or two drummers here, and then we share it, you see, so it's not just as bad. The kangaroo on the hat meant there was no mistaking the new homeland of Portadown expatriate Jack Orr. He returns for the 12th every four years, but for the tercentenary, he made a special visit bringing his son and grandson. I love to come home to Ulster. Uh, I think uh, there's always a bit of Ulster in me, and uh, I wouldn't have missed this for anything. And you've brought your family with you this year? Yes, I brought my son and uh, a, with his son. Jason, is this your first visit to Northern Ireland? Yeah, it is my first visit, yeah. Have you ever seen anything quite like this before? Uh, no, not like this. No, this is, this is, this is weird. <laughs> it's good. Do you have anything like this in Australia? Uh, we have a procession in Australia. Uh, it's called Moomba, but uh, it wouldn't be anything like this at all. So you're looking forward to a good day today? Oh, yeah. I've had a good day already. It's only early, but I've had a good day already. Yeah. <laughs> Visitors from the United States will be celebrating the tercentenary there on Labor Day in September. Had William lost at the Boyne, his defeat would have had considerable impact on America. The greater part of North America would have been French, the rest would have been Spanish speaking and a good part might have been Russian today if William had not prevailed at the Boyne and at the other battles that, that were part of that whole series of wars. Although Orange societies were formed after the Boyne in 1690, it was not until 1795 that the first Orange Lodges were constituted here in County Armagh after the Battle of the Diamond at Loch Gall. And that bicentenary will be duly celebrated in five years' time. 
But today, everyone was celebrating, including junior lodges like this one from Scarva, who presented a pageant. Tercentenary events have been going on all over the county. In Lurgan, for instance, there was a Brownlow festival which lasted approximately a week. Rich Hill likewise had a festival. Armagh had a festival. Bestbrook uh, ported down are still to their having theirs later on. And Killalay had quite a, an event. In fact, this year we had three new bannerets unfurled and uh, a, a number of uh, orange halls opened and one or two new arches, I think. Sadly missed today was the former Upper Ban MP, the late Harold McCusker, a respected Lambeg drummer. His successor took his place on the platform. My message today basically is to t reassure people that there's nothing untoward happening or likely to happen as a result of the contacts and the preparations for talks and things like that that are going on. To reassure them that the unionist parties are standing absolutely firm that the difficulties have arisen, which have arisen recently, apparently have been because Dublin has been trying to uh, upset things at the last moment, and to tell people that no matter what Charlie thinks he's doing, he's not going to get any change out of us, and I somehow don't think he's going to get any change out of Peter Brook either. Despite the odd shower of rain, the Tercentenary Twelfth in Armagh has been voted a huge success by orange men and their visitors alike. County officials are estimating a 50% increase on last year's turnout. So, as the lodges prepare to listen to the speeches and resolutions here at the field, we leave Newton Hamilton and join Cyril Troy in Limavady. Thank you, Jeannie, and welcome to a rather damp Limavady for the biggest twelfth day that this town has ever known. Normally the lodges of the City of London Derry and the northern half of the county meet every year, but this time the men from South Derry are coming along as well. They have given up the right to have their own demonstration, to have a united one and really mark the tercentenary. That means that today we're having 120 lodges with bands, and when you add in the visitors as well, we're going to have about 50,000 people packing into Limavady. Not bad for a town with a population of about 12,000. Here now comes the big parade, and in pride of place at the front are officers of the City of London Derry Grand Lodge with a new set of three standards and banneret to mark the tercentenary. In fact, the Grand Lodge have gone to great lengths to make the anniversary a special one. To begin with, they have inaugurated a standard bearer competition among their five districts, and this will now be an annual event. The winners from District 5 and runners up of District 2 form the bearer party today. And still in the competitive angle, because it's tercentenary year, judges along today's route are taking stock of all the bands in the Grand Lodge section of the parade, and the top four will receive awards. The best drum major is also being singled out for a prize. This is Coleraine District now, and immediately behind the district officers comes a very special band, leading the first of the area's 15 lodges, Blacker LOL number no. 5. This is the Derry Flute Band from Toronto, which has crossed the Atlantic en bloc for the third time to take part in a 12th parade. It was previously here in Limavady in 1982 and in Coleraine three years ago. Bandmaster Bill Medland and his wife Donna, also a band member, came over as well in 1985 to march with their friends in Coleraine Fife and Drum Band. And as Bill told me earlier, it's quite a connection that's been built up, all because of his band's original request to the Cole Rain Boys for some help when they were changing their instruments. It's one of those things we dream about. <laughs> Not, a, you know, it, and it has, and we're really pleased that we've made many, many friends over here. Uh, we are issuing the invitation to Cole Rain to come and visit us in 1992. And if they want to make it 93, that's fine with us. As I said earlier, we really have two demonstrations rolled into one here with the linking up of the South Derry Lodges, but sadly it's not likely to happen often. If we had trains, there wouldn't have been two demonstrations at any time uh, because of transport difficulties that we had to divide the county in two. And how many buses have you coming from South Derry today? Well, we estimate probably about 80 to 90. See, there are over 70 lodges in the south end of the county and supporters, so we're estimating roughly about 80 to 90 buses. And then, of course, there'll be a lot of private cars. Well, now, you're doing this for the tercentenary. Will, right. will you do this again in the future? It'd be very difficult to say. 
transport difficulty, you know, transport uh, difficulties makes it hard. It's very difficult to get buses all in time. I wouldn't say it'll not happen, but it won't happen for some time. Had South Derry been staging its own celebrations as normal, Maharafelt District would have been the hosts this year. But Maharafelt won't lose out in the end, for they will carry that role on to the next year, when they'll be in their own new orange field, bought just a short time ago for £40,000. That's a sign that the Orange Order's in good shape in South Derry, and indeed I understand that tercentenary events run by the various districts have encouraged an influx of new members to all the lodges. Finally, we come to the last section of today's parade, host Slim Avadi, led by District Master William Scott. And if the locals look rather pleased with themselves as they march along, why not? They set out to make the decoration of the town rather special to mark the tercentenary, and they succeeded. William Scott tells me they've got a great many flags donated for the occasion and they're grateful to all the benefactors. He also recalls that at one stage the Grand Lodge of Ireland considered holding a competition for the best decorated town. Unfortunately they didn't go ahead with that, for he believes Limavadi would have taken some beating. I'm watching specially now for Largy Sons of William. They have a new Lodge Master this year, Victor Wilson, and he's following in famous footsteps. For his predecessor, David Donaldson, held office for 51 years and led the lodge in every 12th in that time. I understand David's not keeping too well and cannot be in the parade today, but I'm sure he's watching our pictures and I hope they help ease his disappointment. Well, the rain hasn't stopped, but it hasn't spoiled the atmosphere of Limavady's big parade, which has taken almost three hours to pass. As the last of the marchers make their way on towards the Orange Field on Romill Road, it's time to say goodbye from here and visit some of the day's other demonstrations with Johnny Irvine. There was a break in tradition in County Fermanagh when a Canadian flute band from the town of Enniskillen, Vancouver, led the parade in Enniskillen. That honour is usually given to Orangemen from across the border, but this year they were behind their transatlantic brethren. In all, about 90 bands and lodges took part in the two-mile walk through the town. At the end of the march to the field, some had walked further than others, but few further than the members of one lodge in Kesh. They marched 16 miles to Enniskillen to raise money for Orange charities. The demonstrations in County Antrim are traditionally some of the biggest to take place outside Belfast, and given the occasion, the 12th of July 1990, as celebrated in Ballymena, could be no different. There was a big Scottish presence with an entire lodge from Stranraer among the marchers. At the field on the Cullybacky Road, the Orangemen were addressed by the Grand Master of Scotland, Brother Magnus Bain, who is also the President of the World Orange Council. Some 29 lodges took part in this demonstration, and despite the incessant rain, the crowd still turned out in force to compliment the marchers and to pick out friends and relatives taking part. Of the three parades in Tyrone today, the one in Stewartstown was the largest, with lodges from seven districts in the east of the county involved. The Brethren from Killyman led the parade, which included a contingent in period costume, depicting King William's army at the Battle of the Boyne. Several lodges were displaying new banners, while some bands were stepping out in bright new uniforms, all no doubt required to mark the tercentenary. Tyrone has a fine tradition for producing some of the best pipe bands in the country, and pipe music was the prevalent sound from the parade.
Orange Brethren in the Morn District hold their own 12th demonstration. This year, 15 lodges and 16 bands took part. Analong or Kilkeel alternate as host villages, and this year it was the turn of Kilkeel to put out the bunting. It is one of the smallest parades in the province, but as the district master told me, we mightn't be big, but we feel important. This year, it was the job of the Silent Valley Lords to lead the procession to the field on the Mance Road. Those on the march could look forward to refreshments there. One distinction the caterers near the Kingdom of Morn have is that they provide tea and sandwiches free for all comers. It's not surprising then there was a big turnout at this, the mid-parade break. The parade in Rosnaula incorporates a number of elements that set it apart from all others. Most notable is the fact that it takes place in the Republic of Ireland. It is a unique happening on the other side of the border. This was of course a 12th demonstration, but it occurred in the holiday resort not today, but on Saturday. It is always on the Saturday preceding the 12th because it is not a public holiday in ERA. The timing also allows the marchers from the three historical counties of Ulster, Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal to attend parades in Northern Ireland on the actual 12th. The marchers set a leisurely pace and the bands that took part reflected that. The pipes were in keeping with the rural setting, in this the most northerly of the southern counties. Members of the independent Orange Institution from all over the province assembled at Balamani, where a good crowd turned out to cheer the 20 lodges on show. Before the parade got underway, the leader of the DUP, the Reverend Ian Paisley, paid his respects to King Billy, who was to lead the procession through the town. This demonstration is the high point in the independent Orange Man's calendar, but it is not the only event. During the run-up to today, trees have been planted and plaques unveiled in Balamani to mark the tercentenary. Dr Paisley led the parade. He was later to tell those at the field that there was no place for the Dublin government at the conference table on Northern Ireland's affairs. The independent institution passed seven resolutions, among them one calling for a resolute security policy to smash terrorism. Well, the weather really hasn't been very kind to us today. And back here in Belfast, the Orange Men are still on their way to the field. It's not the last time that the Orange Men will take to the streets of Belfast in such numbers because of the importance of this anniversary to the Orange Order, the tercentenary of the Battle of the Boyne. They will be back again on the streets of Belfast at the end of September. But for now, goodbye.